Okay, and uh, we'll get started and there might be some people trickling in some more. So, uh, all right, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining in on the Marine Institute Graduate Society seminar series. We meet typically every other week on Thursday at noon in this room, but we also live stream all of the um, uh, presentations. And so this is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, where you can find almost all of our seminars over the past couple of years. So before we start, we want to provide a land acknowledgement. Uh, we respectfully acknowledge the land in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and the island of Newfoundland as the unceded traditional territory of the Beothic and Mi'kmaq. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nanatsiavit and Nunatukavit and the Innu of Nitasinan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive to res uh, for respectful relationships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. So today we will hear from Dr. Audrey Limoges. Uh, Audrey obtained her PhD degree at the Université du Québec at Montréal before doing postdoctoral research at the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland in Copenhagen. In 2017, she moved to Fredericton, where she is currently associate professor in the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of New Brunswick. She is specialized in the use of microfossils, biomarkers, and geochemical tracers recovered from marine sediment to reconstruct changes in sea ice, ocean circulation, and export primary production. So with that, I will now pass it off to Dr. Limoges. Thank you, Rachel. I'm just going to sh share my screen. Okay, so uh, this morning, this early afternoon, I will present some of the work that is done in my lab. Um, there is different contexts. There, there are different research questions that we try to, um, uh, to answer, but there is one common denominator, and it is the use of uh, tracers or proxies that are preserved in sediment to understand the response of different components of marine ecosystems to uh, climate fluctuations. Um, in the high latitudes, uh, one of the most evident signs of, of climate change, as, as you probably all know in, in this room, is, is the changes in the, of the cryosphere. And on this figure that I borrowed from uh, Meyer and, and Strobe, uh, we see the, the Arctic sea ice trend for uh, the period between uh, 1979 to 2021 for the month of March, so the, <clears throat> the maximum uh, annual seasonal sea ice extent, and the month of September, and the color code indicates the percent of change uh, uh, per decade during this interval relative to the average of the interval 1981 to 2010. And what we see is that sea ice is declining, uh, declining almost everywhere in the Arctic, but there are some regions that are more impacted than, than others, including uh, the Arctic Ocean. And some regions of the Arctic Oceans that are even more impacted, including um, the Chukchi Sea, the, the Beaufort Sea and the East Siberian Sea. I'm not sure if you can see actually my, my mouse, but I'm, I'm pointing uh, here. Um, maybe I can use the... Uh, see if no, I we can see the mouse there. You can see it? Okay. <laughs> and so the most important changes are observed in, in the summer, but there are also changes uh, in the sea ice in the winter. And those changes are also... Um, are uh, mostly uh, at the sea ice limit, so the seasonal sea ice limit. And we can see this uh, ice loss in the St. Lawrence system, but also along the Newfoundland and the, and the Labrador coast. Um, in addition uh, to these long-term uh, trends in the sea ice decline, uh, the warming of the Arctic is also associated with changes in the sea ice seasonality. And here we see the melt uh, onset trend and the freeze up uh, trend. Uh, so we see that uh, the melt onset is uh, uh, 10 to 20 days earlier per decade. Um, but most, or I should say the most dramatic changes are observed with the freeze up uh, trends. 
And here again, it's uh, the Beaufort, the Chapchi, and the, the East Siberian seas that are the, the most affected. And these changes in the seasonality, uh, of course, influence the, the time over which the oceans can absorb the energy from the sun. So it preconditions the oceans for the following season. Um, but here, where I want to go with, with all this is that there are long term trends. In addition to changes in the seasonal sea ice dynamics, and these can have different kinds of, of uh, consequences for uh, the marine ecosystems. Uh, indeed, the, the melting of the Arctic uh, sea ice, the melting of the Arctic uh, ice sheet, and changes in the uh, hydrological cycle um, that are linked to the warming of the air masses. Um, have important consequences for the freshwater budget of the Arctic uh, domain. And this has direct consequences for the properties of the water masses, for the structure of the water column, um, with direct impact for the organisms that uh, inhabit those, um, those water masses. And this starts with, with the phytoplankton. So the, the phytoplankton abundance and species composition uh, is determined by the light availability. Uh, so sea ice conditions are, are super important. Uh, the temperature, uh, salinity, and also the structure of the water column determines uh, the general availability of light and also nutrients uh, to phytoplankton. Um, and because phytoplankton is at the basis of the marine food webs, we produce their primary uh, source of food for uh, organisms uh, higher up the, the food chain. Trying to understand um, how climate change influences the, the total production, so the abundance, uh, the distribution, but also the composition of the phytoplankton communities is, is an important research question. And it has far reaching consequences for the marine resources, but also for the carbon cycle. So it has uh, implications for the regulation of the, of the climate. Um, but because changes in the oceans are not uniform, so we've seen in the previous maps that even changes in sea ice are not uh, um, uh, uh, the same uh, everywhere in the Arctic region. And because there are very important interannual variations in the productivity, it is still at the moment very difficult to predict the future evolution of uh, Arctic marine uh, primary production. Uh, phytoplankton has a very short uh, lifespan. Uh, if it's not, or if it's incompletely consumed by uh, other organisms, the organic matter will be exported from the surface to the, the seafloor. A large portion will be recycled uh, at the surface, but also as the organic matter sinks uh, to the, to the seafloor. But still a significant fraction uh, of this organic matter will reach the seafloor where it will contribute to the uh, accumulation of, of mud or, or uh, sediment. And uh, these particles uh, that settle and accumulate on the seafloor can provide a long-term archive of changes in uh, primary production and in surface or um, uh, deeper uh, uh, properties of the, of the water column. Um, this archive is, uh, is not perfect, so it provides a, a fragmentary signature or a fragmentary picture of the surface productivity because of different processes that take place in the water column and in the sediment, uh, including the chemical dissolution of the skeletal remains of uh, phytoplankton organisms, uh, also the different functional groups of primary pro uh, producers do not have the same uh, preservation potential, so some groups will be better preserved uh, than other, and of course we have to take into account the grazing and the bacterial degradation that takes place in the water column and uh, in the sediment uh, through time. Um, but still, this archive is, um, is highly valuable because it allows us to extend uh, observational data by several centuries or even uh, millennia. So we can go at sea and use different kinds of uh, sediment covers that allow us to retrieve this uh, sedimentary archive. 
And we can then analyze a series of different uh, tracers or proxies um, that are preserved uh, in the sediment. Uh, and these can be used to reconstruct changes in productivity or changes in environmental conditions uh, through time. So we can look at the skeletal remains of those phytoplankton organisms. Uh, so diatoms, uh, the cyst of dinoflagellates or, or uh, foraminifers. We can look at the, the sedimentary DNA, the grain size, which can be an indication of the uh, dynamic of the environment of deposition. Um, the pigments that can be preserved uh, in the sediment and also different uh, geochemical and biomarker tracers uh, that can be also preserved uh, in the sediment. So uh, basically, this uh, allows us to look at the response of marine ecosystems um, uh, during the transition from uh, the transitions from uh, colder to warmer uh, intervals of the geological past. Um, however, to fully understand uh, the, the signal that is preserved uh, in the sediment, we also need to better understand when and how the different proxies are produced uh, during a year. So this aspect of seasonality is also important uh, to consider. And one way to better understand this seasonal uh, signal is to look at sediment trap samples um, so sediment uh, traps uh, collect sinking materials um, uh, during annual cycles or, or any predetermined um, uh, intervals. So there is a carousel with um, sample cups that are attached at the basis of a sort of, of funnel. Um, so the particles will sink and will be collected by this funnel. And we can uh, pre-program the sample cups to rotate at uh, predefined uh, intervals. And when we retrieve those sediment traps, we can then have an idea of the phenology, so the seasonal changes in the phytoplankton abundance and species composition through time, uh, which is uh, presumed to be tightly connected to the light cycle in the uh, Arctic region. Um, so for the next slides, I will uh, present some case uh, studies from the from three main regions. Uh, so from the Picola Sorswak, uh, the Northwater Polynesia here between Greenland and Ellesmere Island, uh, from uh, Nunatsiavut, and also from the Lower uh, Saint Lawrence Estuary. Um, so the North uh, Water Polynesia or the Picola Sorswak uh, is an area of open water conditions in, um, in Northern Baffin Bay that is associated with the upwelling of relatively warm waters from the West Greenland current, especially in the Eastern sector. So the, the, Greenland, the Greenland side of the, of the area. <clears throat> and it is also associated and, and tightly connected to the formation of a nice bridge in Narrow Strait. So Narrow Strait is here. Uh, and this ice bridge is formed uh, by the blockage of multi year sea ice that ultimately originates uh, in the Lincoln Sea, so in the Arctic Ocean, and becomes uh, 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 blocked um, uh, in the narrow passages of the, of the Narrow Strait. And the prevailing winds, so the, the polar easterlies, constantly pushed newly formed uh, sea ice in this region south, so they contribute with the ice bridge to keeping the area free of ice. Um, and the Polynia, uh, so this open water region, plays a major role in, in the, uh, the regional ecosystem, uh, so it provides a source of moisture um, for the surrounding environment. Uh, it is believed to act as an important carbon sink uh, through brine rejections. Uh, and importantly, the ice-free uh, uh, waters allow for an unusually uh, early phytoplankton bloom that can last between two to four months. Uh, and this makes this region the most productive region of the Arctic. So the, the Picola Sorswak um, uh, Polynia is uh, the region of the Arctic that is the most productive.
but in recent years, the consolidation of the ice bridge in, in Narrow Strait is becoming less stable. Um, so this is associated with uh, the warming, or climate, uh, climate warming, but also uh, changes in the sea ice dynamics and, and wind uh, regimes. And the ice bridge uh, collapses um, more frequently and, in fact, completely failed to form for the first time in 2007. Uh, so first time since we have access to uh, satellite data. And since then, it completely failed to form in 2009, 10, 17, 19, and uh, 22. Um, and when the ice bridge uh, fails to form, there is more multi-year sea ice that can be lost from the Arctic Ocean to the, the North uh, Atlantic uh, system. Uh, there is a higher volume of fresh water that is, is exported. <clears throat> and uh, mobile uh, uh, sea ice, so a thick sea ice that is mobile, can accumulate in the, in the Polynia region, which can also impact the productivity of, uh, of the Polynia and the ecosystems that are supported by uh, the Polynia. Uh, but we do not yet have enough, enough uh, perspective on the impacts of uh, ice arc uh, instability um, to assess the future evolution of the Picola Sarswak ecosystem. So our databases, observational uh, databases, are too limited uh, temporally. So this is where long-term sediment archives can provide complementary valuable uh, information. Um, so we know that the Polynia has uh, provided subsistence resources, so marine resources for hunting cultures uh, along the, the coast for millennia, and it is still very important today. And on this uh, time scale, we see uh, the cultural transitions on the Greenland side of the Polynia, but archaeological sites from the Canadian side of the Polynia also show that there were settlements uh, since at least around the, the same time as the Independence One culture in Greenland. So there is uh, archaeological evidence for human uh, settlements on the Canadian side of the Polynia since around 4,200 years. Um, we know that the Narrow Strait opened some 8.3 uh, thousand years ago when the uh, Ellesmere and the Greenland ice sheets retreated during the, the Holocene uh, Thermal Optimum. And the opening of the North Water Polynia is dated to around 4.5 thousand years ago. And this date is inferred from uh, the evidence for the establishment of the Little Oak colonies uh, in Greenland. Um, uh, so today, the, the Polynia supports 80% uh, of the global uh, breeding population of, of Little Oaks, and their most important prey item is, uh, are the, is the copepods that are found in the Polynia. Uh, so Calanus uh, hyperboris, if I'm not wrong. Um, and it is also around that time that we have the first uh, evidence for the arrival of, of humans uh, in Greenland with the Independence One uh, culture. And they, uh, they, pro they came from the west and likely crossed uh, the ice bridge uh, to reach uh, the Greenland side of the Polynia. Um, and then until recently, we did not know much uh, about the evolution of the Polynia for the, for the rest of the, of the late Holocene. Uh, but interestingly, there is this interval characterized by the absence of archaeological evidence for the presence of, of people uh, in the Greenland region of the, of the Polynia. So archaeological studies suggest that, um, that Greenland was uninhabited for about a thousand years, which, which would uh, point uh, to uh, changes in the environment, uh, although other uh, cultural or uh, economic factors must be considered when we talk about uh, human. And I will come back to that later. Uh, so in 2014, uh, we uh, collected a long sediment core from the central region of the North uh, Water Polynia at this uh, study site here, and you can see the sub-bottom profiles uh, here. And the core is around 5.5 uh, meters, and it covers uh, 3,800 uh, years. So not quite since the opening of the Polynia, but it provides a high-resolution record of the late Holocene. 
So our, uh, our objective here was to cover this, um, uh, uh, this gap of the time scale uh, for which we, we didn't know how the polynia um, uh, evolved. Um, and the results from the analysis of this marine core were compared to data from a lake uh, core that recorded changes in the little oak colonies, which are seen as a keystone species of the Polynia ecosystem, and were also put next to the available archaeological data. And from the marine uh, core, we studied uh, tracers of marine productivity, but also biomarkers of, of sea ice, to, uh, to track changes in the, in the sea ice dynamics in, in the region. Um, so here the main uh, results are, are shown. Uh, so this, this study was uh, led by uh, Sofia Ribeiro. Um, and uh, you can see at the top the, the marine uh, data, uh, here the time scale of uh, human prehistory, and here the data from the, from the lake car. Um, so what we uh, observed with this uh, study is that this period of, um, uh, of Greenland abandonment was associated with a decline in the little oak colonies, uh, but also a major decline in the marine productivity and a change in the sea ice dynamics. So we have this increase in uh, this biomarker called triene, which is associated with a marginal uh, ice uh, uh, zone conditions. Uh, so, uh, basically, in this study, we identified an ecosystem regime uh, shift around uh, 2000 years uh, um, ago here, which coincides with the beginning of a warm interval, the Roman warm uh, period, which is one of the warm uh, intervals of, of, the, of the late Holocene. Uh, so, in simple terms, we uh, identified a collapse of the uh, ecosystem, uh, of the Polynia ecosystem, which was associated with a contraction or, or uh, unstable Polynia conditions during this uh, interval of uh, human uh, abandon, uh, abandonment. <clears throat> um, and interestingly, there is also evidence from other studies that show that the ice bridge um, uh, was also uh, unstable during uh, starting from the, the Roman uh, warm uh, period. So we had several evidence that multiple uh, components of the ecosystem changed uh, significantly at the beginning of the Roman warm period. So on the same marine sediment core, we wanted to further explore uh, changes in the diatom assemblages, uh, since diatoms are the the dominant primary producers in the in the Polynia, we wanted to evaluate bottom up uh, effects. Uh, so how the lower traffic levels affect a uh, community structure of the upper traffic levels. Um, a first observation uh, is that the diatom assemblages that uh, are the diatom species that are preserved in the sediment uh, show very diverse shape but a very large range of size. And most of the early uh, bloomers, so those species that bloom directly after the sea ice melt, so the cryopelagic species, are um, much smaller than the species that are found later in the successional uh, stages. So those species that are more typical of the uh, uh, later in the, in the summer. Uh, and here uh, we see uh, a picture of, of, uh, that shows the, the size difference. So for example, here we have this species, Fragila hyopsis cylindris. So you can um, uh, see that it is much, much smaller than this uh, species here, uh, Pohoseha glacialis. Uh, importantly, we also noticed that there was a significant correlation between the mean diatom size and the total diatom abundance in the in the sediment and the fluxes of diatoms that accumulated in, in the sediment. Uh, so periods with high diatom fluxes were those periods where the small early bloomers, uh, so those uh, small species, were the main contributors to the uh, assemblages, so they were uh, more abundant. So this suggests that the dawn core uh, changes in the diatom size may uh, reflect changes in the amplitude and also changes in the duration of the early spring bloom, 
uh, in the region. So the size is uh, important to take into account uh, here. Um, so we see the main results uh, uh, in this diagram. So you have to read the, this diagram from the right to the left. So this is the bottom of our car, so the, the oldest part, and this is more recent uh, time. There is a lot of information in this diagram, but the main uh, points are that the colder intervals of the, of the late Holocene, so shown with the blue shading uh, here, were associated with increased uh, diatom abundance, more diverse uh, diatom assemblages, and, and smaller cells, uh, so increase uh, production of the early uh, bloomer diatoms. And this was associated with increased biomass that had accumulated on, on the seafloor. Um, and the warmer intervals of the late Holocene were associated with a lower production, uh, less diverse uh, diatom assemblages that were dominated by uh, larger cells. And we could, when we look at the composition of the assemblages, we also notice that there was an increased contribution of the species that are adapted to low light irradiance or uh, subsurface uh, conditions. Uh, so uh, here, all the matrix of, of diatoms changed uh, significantly at the beginning of the, of the Roman Warren period which corresponds um, uh, again to the uh, ecosystem regime shift that was identified in the previous study. Uh, so the polynia instability again likely was associated with those major changes in the diatom productivity. And I forgot to mention, but those numbers uh, here, so the, the total diatom concentrations here are comparable to those observed in non polynia settings. Uh, so this is another evidence or another um, uh, yes, another uh, evidence that uh, the polynia was not uh, definitely not as productive and probably collapsed around uh, 2000 years ago. So during the cold uh, intervals of, of the late Holocene, there was a stable ice arc that was associated with increased uh, export production. And this increased export production was steered by uh, the strong pulse of small, fast-growing early bloomer uh, diatoms. And this pulsatile um, uh, production of food is important uh, to keystone species, including the little oaks that have adapted their uh, life history uh, accordingly. <clears throat> uh, by contrast, uh, when the ice bridge does not consolidate, uh, such as during the, uh, the Roman Warm period and as projected for the future, uh, there is an increase um, in the, the abundance of ice flows in, in the Polynia uh, area, uh, increased salinity stratification also of the water column, which uh, reduces the, the export production of, of diatoms um, and also the timing of the diatom bloom. Um, and large diatoms that are associated with the late, success late uh, successional uh, stages dominate uh, the uh, assemblages. So this uh, suggests that the strong pulse of early spring diatoms that is responsible for making the polynia exceptionally productive is uh, threatened by the, the rapid warming and associated destabilization of the ice bridge. Uh, so um, now we are moving on to the second case study uh, in Nunat Savit, so the coastal region of Maine. Um, the coastal <coughs> area of Maine is uh, characterized by the presence of uh, small recurring polynias uh, shown here in, in green uh, that are referred to as rattles um, in the community. And even if they are small, they are considered as um, biological uh, hotspots for, for the region. Um, and here again, those uh, recurring polynias and the associated ice edge um, uh, habitats uh, have provided subsistence resources for hunting cultures living along the coast uh, for, for millennia. And there is abundant archaeological data that provide evidence for settlements in the main region, including uh, skeletal remains of, of uh, hunting, uh, hunted uh, animals uh, used um, 
for uh, the subsistence that, that documents the activity of the Dorset and Inuit cultures with sites dated to uh, 2,500 uh, years. Uh, and these sites are illustrated with the, the black uh, squares here. So those are all the documented archaeological sites in the coastal region of, of Maine. Uh, so for this project, uh, our objective is to evaluate the effect of past uh, climate change on the functioning of the coastal ecosystem of Maine and their impacts on the provisioning and cultural services. Uh, so we compare, uh, we are comparing paleo environmental data, so um, uh, paleo data from the marine coastal environment to the archaeological data that are another source of information about uh, the, the marine ecosystem. Um, so during the last three years, we have collected uh, data and sediment samples from uh, the region to reconstruct um, changes in the ocean conditions and primary production during the last two to three uh, thousand years. Um, our objective, one of our objectives is to generate high uh, resolution maps of the modern distribution of the different sedimentary proxies. And this will then be used to, um, uh, to understand the long-term signal that is preserved in sediment cores. Um, and we also deployed moorings equipped with sediment traps at those two locations here that will be used to uh, better understand the phenology of production in the area. Um, so to better understand the seasonal signal that is preserved in the sediment. But we just retrieved them, so I, I won't be able to uh, show some, some uh, results. Uh, but this morning, I will show some uh, preliminary uh, data that we have uh, from, the, from the region. So um, here we, uh, we see the general pattern of distribution of dinoflagellate cysts. Uh, so, uh, dinoflagellate cysts are uh, produced by certain species of dinoflagellates, so they can be considered as microfossils, and they are made of, uh, composed of organic matter that has a very high uh, preservation potential in the sediment. Um, and interestingly, what we observe with those preliminary data is that um, the polynias are associated with the lowest di di dinoflagellate cyst concentration. So, probably the opposite to what we were expecting. Um, and concentration overall are not excessively high, but we have uh, identified regions of increased abundance. Uh, so in Main Bay here and in uh, 10 Mile Bay. Uh, so it doesn't mean that those regions are more productive, uh, but perhaps simply that the, the depositional environment is, is, uh, is calmer, so the, the cysts can calmly settle on, on the seafloor and accumulate there. Um, and also I should, I should say that those pollinias are formed because of very strong currents. So it's very likely that those are productive regions, but then the, the cells are uh, advected to other regions by those, uh, import, those very strong uh, currents. Uh, so here we see the pattern of distribution of the benthic foraminifers. So again, another type of microfossil um, foraminifers are composed of calcium carbonate or agglutinated material. So everything uh, that uh, the, the organism find uh, in the environment. Um, and what we see is that the assemblages are extremely diverse. So there are more than 75 different species of benthic foraminifers that have been identified. So that, that's a lot. Um, uh, uh, that's a lot for, for a relatively um, uh, 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 small uh, area. And we see that the regions of uh, increased abundance of benthic foraminifers do not match with the, the regions of increased uh, abundance of dinoflagellate cysts, which may hint to uh, differences in the seasonal signal that is preserved uh, by both uh, groups. So that's actually interesting. Um, so this is where we are at with this component of, of, the, of the project, and we are now analyzing the, the other proxies of primary production uh, preserved in the sediment, including the, the subfossil diatoms, the biomarkers, and the geochemical uh, 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 signature of, of the sediment. And our ultimate uh, objective is to reconstruct changes in the sea ice dynamics, as it is an important platform for transport 
changes in primary production and also changes in the input from the uh, coastal Labrador current, which seems to have a pervasive uh, influence on the physical environment and uh, the biological component of the uh, ecosystem. For the third um, case study, I will end with the master project of uh, Hannah Sharp, who completed our the creatures uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, for this study, we investigated the influence of a submarine canyon system located offshore Point des Monts here in the lower St. Lawrence estuary on the export of biogenic matter in, in the region. And this, uh, this canyon is not uh, here is not uh, located very far from the entrance to the Saguenay uh, St. Lawrence Marine Park. So we wanted to uh, evaluate the influence of, of this system on the productivity of the, of the region. Uh, so for this project, we deployed three moorings, uh, one uh, here uh, deployed offshore Bécomo and two in the main uh, canyon uh, uh, system. Uh, shown here. So um, in the in the main uh, canyon system here, we deployed one um, uh, mooring equipped with uh, downward and upward uh, looking EBCP. So the transducers were uh, oriented towards the surface of the water column and towards the, the seafloor. And then 2.6 kilometers away, we also deployed another mooring equipped with two sediment traps. Uh, so one um, uh, at two different uh, depths. And I should say that at the Bécomo site, we also uh, deployed uh, a sediment trap. And um, in uh, this region, the water column is very well stratified and the, th the three sediment traps that we deployed are within the, the warmer deep layer of the, of the water column. Um, and before showing some preliminary, uh, not preliminary, but some, some results, I should say that the canyon is um, around 3.5 kilometers long with a uh, width that uh, varies between 100 and 300 meters and a maximum depth of 300 meters. Uh, so Anna's work showed that the taxonomic composition of, um, of the Bécomo and Point des Monts uh, stations were uh, about the same. Uh, um, so the species of diatoms and dinoflagellates were pretty much the same at, the, at both sides. Uh, however, the overall productivity was much lower in the canyon compared to uh, the Bécomo site. Uh, so the diatom and the dinoflagellate fluxes were almost two times lower than that observed uh, at the, at the Bécomo uh, site. Um, and here we see uh, results um, from at the top here, you can see the, the results from the uh, ADCP, so the acoustic backscatter uh, in decibel. So the more uh, red, the, the more powerful the, the acoustic signal. And here you can see the main uh, results for the sediment traps that were deployed at the exit of the canyon. So almost, as I said, three kilometers away from the main canyon system. Um, and what we uh, were able to capture is a small uh, turbidity current uh, in the winters, so at the beginning of the month of uh, February. And this was associated with increased fluxes of total particulate matter, uh, particulate organic carbon and nitrogen uh, at um, the uh, offshore uh, sediment trap uh, location that is, as I said, 2.6 kilometers away. Um, and the turbidity current event uh, caused lofting of uh, suspended particles, meaning that the heavy and, and coarser sediments quickly sink again, uh, but the, uh, the lighter sediment rise in the water column and it is kept in suspension along the strong uh, density gradient in, in the water column. And in this way, the sediment can be uh, carried over large distances away from um, the event uh, itself. So we propose that the vertical structure of the water column may contribute to enhancing the dispersion of resuspended sediments in the canyon, which may uh, enhance the regional impact of uh, sediment processes that take place in, uh, in that uh, canyon. 
So even if this canyon is uh, relatively small, it influences the vertical fluxes of particles at a lateral distance of at least 2.6 kilometers uh, within the deep uh, water uh, layer. Um, so, so this, uh, these data suggest that larger turbidity currents, which are known to occur every two to three years in the Point des Monts Canyon system, may have a relatively severe and widespread impact on the Point des Monts uh, ecosystem. Um, so, a, uh, so we should uh, then continue to monitor the ecosystem and, and try to see uh, if more of those uh, turbidity currents can be. Uh, uh, captured by uh, our uh, moraines. Um, Anna's paper is, is now accepted and it is uh, available as a preprint in, in Biogeosciences. So if you are interested by uh, this study, you can uh, have a look at her, uh, her paper. Uh, so I will stop here. There's a lot of collaborators that contributed to, uh, to the work uh, that, I, that I presented. Um, they are listed here and I will be happy to uh, take questions. Thank you, Audrey. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I'll open up the floor now for questions from the audience. Yes, go ahead, Gordon. Hey, great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I was hoping to know, you mentioned at the beginning, some phytoplankton or some plankton are better at being preserved over long periods than others. And why might that be? Like, what characteristics? Yeah, good question. So they have different chemical compositions. So, for example, the cyst of dinoflagellates, they are composed of uh, organic um, uh, organic matter that is really refractory. So it's not affected, for example, by the pH of the water uh, and, and they will preserve very well. The uh, foraminifers, for example, are have a test that can be composed of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate can dissolve uh, under uh, for example, if if uh, if the pH is low uh, in regions where there is a lot of brine produ production, so where the sea ice formation is is uh, is very effective, uh, then the deep water will be more uh, acidic, and this can contribute to the the dissolution of of their tests. So it's mostly linked to the chemical composition of of those uh, phytoplankton groups. And if actually they produce a test or a shell or something that protects uh, the cell during their life cycle. Right on. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead, John. Enjoyed your presentation. Thank you very much. I have a question about uh, um, the sort of fragmentary signature that you mentioned at the start. I wonder, uh, based on the results from the, the first example, the, the vignette, um, in the past, these large diatoms were sinking and being preserved, and the, the small ones were in lower, uh, lower sort of representation. I wondered, within these cores, what role is attributed to uh, grazing or the lack of grazers in some of these systems? And I ask because some of the projections for the future would be that some species from microbes to zooplankton to fish might become smaller in the Arctic. And is it could it be that? Uh, the absence of large body zooplankton grazing large diatoms could lead to higher accumulations of diatoms in these sediments. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a very good point. So the, the size of the diatoms um, can influence, for example, their, their buoyancy. It influences where they are found um, and, and when they are found in the water column during a seasonal, um, uh, during a season, during the, the different seasons. And definitely, the grazers can have an impact on uh, on the signal that that is preserved. But overall, we should assume that, uh, especially for the diatoms, if there is a lot of them, then the signal will be higher in the sediment. Also, because it has been shown that even after passing through the digestive tract of grazers, uh, the the cells, so the, the, the valves can be preserved, actually. So even if they are grazed, we should still be able to find their signal in the sediment. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. I think Fintan here has a question, so I'll just unmute him. Request unmute. Hopefully he can, they, they can uh, ask the question. Let me see. 
We can't hear you yet, Fintan. It might be best to type out the uh, question if you can't get a sound through. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Oh, yep. You can hear me? Yep, there you go. Okay, yeah. So what would you say, like, uh, are the strengths and limitations of this uh, research? Uh, in general, so the use of uh, sediment cores. Oh, okay. Uh, so the I would say that the, the advantage of, of looking at sediment cores, the sedimentary signal, is definitely that we can extend our databases temporarily. So when we when we go at sea in the summer, we take one sample of the water column to look at the phytoplankton assemblages. It's one point in time. Uh, in the sediment, we have an integrated uh, signal. Mm -hmm. That is fragmentary, but still we can have an idea of what was produced over the the, the previous uh, season and the previous years. And also because um, it allows us to look at um, the response of those primary producers to multiple changes in the environment. So all these processes are integrated in the sediment and we can then better um, predict the future evolution of a system under uh, climate under climate change. So it brings this long term perspective. So it helps in understanding the overall functioning of the ecosystem. Um, so that's that's an advantage. The, the, the limitation is that, as I said, not all groups, not all functional groups of phytoplankton leave a signature in in the sediment. So we have a bias vision of, of uh, the global phytoplankton and um, uh, communities uh, through time um, and uh, and and so it should be used uh, as a complementary tool basically to understand the functioning the functioning of ecosystem so it's okay. just a different approach to uh, present day observations okay cool and i just have another uh question what were the like the major activities and what were like the major findings of this research uh so i presented three different um uh, case studies uh, in the north uh, water polynia um, i would say that we were able to uh, understand what were um or uh, actually what one of the important drivers of uh, human abandonment in, in Greenland. So the change in the environmental um, uh, components of, of the of the Polynia. Uh, we were also able to uh, help in predicting what will be the future evolution of uh, primary production in, in the region. So that's a big, uh, big question because this region is, is so important in terms of and biodiversity and, and, and resources uh, that we, we basically bring uh, th this kind of, of, of data that can feed uh, discussions. And of course, it should be uh, used in, uh, in, uh, together with all other evidence uh, from the region. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any other questions from people online or in the room? Oops. Let's see. I just had a really quick question out of curiosity. So, due to the fact that those dino flagellate and diatome cysts are so small, I'm just wondering how long does it take to go through and sort a full sediment core? Yeah, it is very long. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> a slow uh, contributor to projects. Um, so, for each sample, depending on the resolution of the analysis, for each sample, we first have to extract those different kinds of microfossils because they have different chemical compositions. It involves different physical and chemical treatments. And then we count up to 300 uh, cells, at least 300 cells per, uh, per sample to have a, a statistically robust uh, number. Um, so. The car that I presented for the North Water Polynia was collected in 2014, and we, the diatom uh, data were uh, published this year. So it's long. Wow. Yeah. It's it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we have to get your eyes checked quite a bit, <laughs> looking at yeah. such small things. <laughs> yeah. All right, great. Um, 
I see someone asked about the recorded seminar. So MIGS has a YouTube channel. If you just look up the Marine Institute Graduate Society on YouTube, you can see all of our past um, recorded seminars from the past few years. So this one will be up there as well. Okay, well, if uh, nobody else has any other questions, uh, thank you so much, Audrey, for your presentation. And thank you everyone for coming to watch your presentation. Uh, we'll doing, we're doing a second seminar here in two weeks time, uh, also from another professor at the University of New Brunswick, and that will be on stable isotopes by Dr. Brian Hayden. So hopefully we'll see you all again in two weeks time. Uh, YouTube channel. I'll just, I'll type out the YouTube link, how about in the chat so people can get it. Someone's still asking about that, but uh, thank you everybody. Thanks Audrey again. Let's see here. See if I can quickly find it. Yep. So there's the YouTube channel for those that were asking. All right. Great. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.